Okay, it's time to begin our uh, review for the final exam. And I want to start off this with a um, reminder to you that one of the best ways to approach physics in the reviewing and seeing it all together again is to go down a list of the problem types. And there aren't that many problem types in this course. Um, uh, this particular page is, can be found under um, uh, helpful links, how to succeed section of the Moodle. Down near the bottom, there's a list of about three files. This is one of them. I'll be showing you the other two. Uh, <clears throat> there's a few definition type problems. There's a few problems that have uh, specific ways of solving them. So trip problems, for example, you're going to solve <clears throat> by using the speed is equal to the distance over time. <clears throat> you're gonna use this. You're probably gonna use it several times. And so you do it for segment one, segment two, however many segments there are total for the trip. You make speed, distance, time. You'll be given a couple and one, you have to find the other, and you fill in the chart till you get the answer you want. That's basically how you do it. You can apply this for segment one, for segment two, for segment three, and for the total of the trip. And you'll probably be applying it for each one of those. Uh, Motion diagrams is more of a set of definitions altogether. And the key there is to look at which ones you're looking at. Relative velocity is a very specific type of problem. You write down that equation, figure out what's what from the, from the statement of the problem. <clears throat> uh, but the big ones here in bold are the kinematics of constant acceleration, Newton's second law, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum. Those are the big ones. Uh, when Now, this is the linear case. When we get along to the rotational case, what do you see? Rotational kinematics, rotational Newton's second law, which includes static and equilibrium, by the way, and centripetal acceleration, where you know AC is uh, V squared over R, or R omega squared. And, and then the um, static equilibrium, and here's angular dynamics, torque net is I alpha. Really what you're doing is adding one more column to the Newton second law for linear. So notice these are all the same, same way of noticing what's what, right? So how to recognize rotational kinematic state is almost the same as how to recognize a linear one. How to recognize a Newton second law, okay? Um, it's the same as you would for the linear case. It's valid at any point in time or at some instant in time. And uh, you have to look at um, what's given. If it's forces given or times accelerations, maybe you should think this, it's all static. What else can you do if it's static besides uh, uh, F equals MA <coughs> or Newton's second law? And then finally you get to the conservation of energy, which again is the same both in how you recognize it and on the strategy for solving it, right? Work and conserving is delta Ke. It's got two terms now plus delta Pe, whatever potential energy terms you have. And um, <clears throat> conservation of momentum goes to conservation of angular momentum. It usually involves the collision where you're interested in uh, one or more objects. And it involves uh, essentially writing this out. <clears throat> so once, if you look back then at the problem solving strategies, this is really it for the entire class, right? And then there's definitions. So uh, that is, um, <clears throat> once you think of it that way, it's much easier to zone in on which one of these is it, or is it a definition? And if you make a list of these on your equation sheet, for example, you can tick off which one it might be. Go check it, go look against the how to recognize ones. Uh, you can even write a few of those on if you have room. Remember, you have both sides of a sheet of paper now. So this one here, and I won't go through all these until I get to the details, um, <clears throat> as I will in a minute. Um, this is one of these uh, sheets or pages there. This is another one for the rotational. Another one of those documents there. And the third document of interest there is sort of this one, which is outlines these in a slightly different um, slightly different way. Uh, it's um, goes through basic math 
which uh, comes from the first uh, unit we did. And then <clears throat> learn methods, not problems. There's only a handful of methods, right? So once you learn those, you learn how to recognize them. That's a pretty good way of recognizing it. And here I give a step-by-step. -step. Read the problem, what to look for, draw a picture. And these things are helping you to figure out how to get started, what type of problem it is. Once you identify the physics com, uh, concept, then there's going to be um, solution methods that go with that. And if you're having trouble identifying these things, you remember, how do you know? How do you know to start it that way? How do you know to do it that way? Um, these are the things that you ask others if you need help while you're in the studying process. And yes, I am available by email and during office hours. <clears throat> so, uh, and when you put in numbers, Put them in with units. Why? That'll check your algebra. And it'll see if you're using the right equation. Uh, that'll make sure that you didn't forget to convert a centimeters to a meters or whatever else you had to do. Maybe you weren't supposed to because the other thing was in centimeters. Um, <clears throat> that is a good check. Um, is the order of magnitude reasonable? Does it make sense? Uh, you have a vector and you're supposed to have a vector. A scalar and you're supposed to have a scalar. Are you actually answering what the question is asking. That's another common problem, surprisingly, is that you assume it's asking something when it's asking something different. And units can help with that, as can just going back and simply checking for it. Uh, and then, of course, multi-step problems are easier this way. And this particular example here comes back and says, OK, uh, here's hints on getting which the physics are. You know, what are you looking for? Kind of words. Uh, you can read this on your own. It's posted again in Moodle under the How to Succeed section down where the links are. Uh, then we go through here, constant acceleration, right, or kinematics, step by step. Newton's second law, step by step, including that all important, make a chart, force, x, y, and torque if it comes from anything in the latter half of the problem. You have to choose an axis for the torque. You have to choose x and y. Um, directions for making these two columns. And when you sum them up all at the bottom, this is going to be equal to max, this is equal to may, this one is equal to i times alpha. Again, it's i about the axis that you chose. And uh, then you go looking around the problem for, okay, what are these accelerations are said in equal to? Well, remember that if you're on a flat surface and you're not bouncing, acceleration perpendicular to the surface is zero. That's common. If you're in circular motion, centripetal acceleration, that's common. <clears throat> uh, if you're in statics, they're all zero. That's common. Uh, and then there's the rules of the rope. Um, what's the same at both ends? Lots of things. And these going to help you get through it. Remember that the Newton's second law applies to one object. So if you have two objects, you have to do it twice. Once the first object, once the second object, find the quantities that are related, like by the rules of the ropes, for example, and give them their own letter and set, say, AX in one problem equal to that. It might be AY in the other, it might be AX. Make sure you get the right one. And then you can go through and solve. <clears throat> Energy conservation problems, I always start with this. No reason not to. If there's no friction or other non-concerning work, set that to zero right away. And then it's a matter of writing down your delta Ks and delta Ps. Sometimes it's final minus initial. Sometimes you just pick the delta right off the problem. Uh, and you've got a couple of different potential energies. You've got regular G gravity and spring at the big two. There's one for big G gravity, but that's not used that much. <clears throat> um, sketches can help you pull these things out. <clears throat> and uh, collision and recoil problems, okay. Uh, you've got linear and circular, both. You have something like a collision in between that isn't described very well, but things change. You look at before and afters. Uh, if it involves one object, you have things like impulse, net force, change in momentum. Uh, net force times delta T is change in momentum, or you just call it the impulse. It's uh, MV final minus MV initial. Big time you play to go wrong here 
is to forget the SIGN signs on these two. If it bounces back, they add up, either more negative or more positive, depending on which way it's going to begin with. So watch the signs, SIGN signs, in calculating the deltas. That's the important one right here. Momentum conservation, you have two objects. You have this for linear in both X and in Y. <clears throat> and you have this um, uh, for final where uh, these are the angular momentums, which are normally I omega, occasionally MRV sine phi for a point object, but normally I omegas. <clears throat> Uh, okay, and so uh, the um, <coughs> moments of inertia, parallel axis theorem, we did relative motion problems. Your best bet is probably, you now this one says draw a picture in each frame and, and draw the arrow in between. That's a graphical way of doing it. It's pretty good. Uh, but just writing down that equation that we always have is another good way to do that. And Doppler shifts, it's plus minus in the top, minus plus on the bottom. Top signs go if they're towards each other, or you can just write it this way, just the top signs, and if they're away from each other, just make it a negative, <clears throat> and that will get you there. And then there's a few other things over here that um, weren't, at the end of this one has some stuff that we just didn't cover this semester. So don't worry about that if you don't recognize it. So now let's get back to <clears throat> going through the summary. So those things give you the general picture. That's important, but it's not going to, of course, get you all the way to the finish line. Uh, so let's go through these, which include a lot of um, uh, a lot of. Uh, <clears throat> I'll do a few examples, and you'll get the definitions here that don't show up so well in the other one there. So chapter one, what did we learn? Unit conversions. These are our friends, right? Always put in numbers, use units on numbers. I don't know how many times I've seen cases where people make a mistake on a problem and it's because they didn't go ahead and put the units on their numbers. They didn't recognize the mistake. Dimensional analysis, again, check your algebra. Uh, but oftentimes, just putting the units on the numbers will do this for you. Significant figures is more of a web assigned problem, <clears throat> but if you're somewhere in between on answers, it can come up. Scientific notation is a way of keeping track of those. Uh, trigonometry, of course, Sokotoa. Draw the triangle out, right? How do you project a vector? Draw the triangle out. How do you figure out what things are? Same as uh, Cartesian to polar. It's all about doing this and going backwards, right? So this is a, b, a squared plus b squared square root. <clears throat> and then you have theta and you have the Sokotoa on the angle theta, where you can also write this as um, opposite adjacent and hypotenuse. Uh, push this up. <clears throat> Solving quadratic equations, you've got a formula for that uh, that I assume, if you can't remember, I assume it's on your equation sheet. You have to know it by heart? Fine. Doesn't have to be on your equation sheet unless you get uh, forgetting of things when you're taking a test. Then, okay, if you got room, put it there. We don't use it that much, it does come up occasionally. So uh, the next um, thing we talk about is definitions. These are our simple definitions here. Our first set of definitions where we talked about what is velocity, average instantaneous, what is speed, average instantaneous. Uh, our chart here of how to do a speed problem. <laughs> and so let's see if I have a speed problem that we can do here. Uh, I think I might. Uh, so <clears throat> suppose uh, yeah, here's one. You might recognize this one. 
There's Amanda is running a three mile race. Once to run at a seven and a half minute per mile pace, which is eight miles an hour. Actually, seven and three quarters is closer to. No, I guess it's eight miles. This is eight miles an hour. Seven and three quarters is when you get a seven and three quarters miles per hour when you're the same, or close to it anyway. Uh, in this race, she runs first mile. And so this one here, we immediately say is, oh, well, we've got distances, we've got times, we've got several different um, uh, segments. So this is a chart. One here, we've got to make our, our uh, segment one, segment two. Uh, what do we do? We use speed, distance, and time. And this particular one, first mile, second mile, and this, and the final, so there's three segments. And so let's go through and fill out what we know. Three mile race, total distance, three miles. Uh, <clears throat> the, she runs the first mile in 0 0.09 hours, one mile of 0 0.09 hours. What speed, uh, second mile is 0.16 hours. Uh, we want speed just need to run the final mile to achieve our goal of this average speed. So this is what we want to know. And it looks like these are all one mile segments. And three mile and average speed is eight miles per hour. Now what do we need, to, what do we know from this chart? Uh, each row Uh, speed is equal to distance divided by time. And then the uh, distance and time columns add. The speed column does not add, just the distance and time columns. So this adds up. And so this one over here is going to be equal to uh, T1 plus T2 plus T3. So, uh, but it's also equal to something else, right? We also have this. And so those have to equal, uh, okay, this is time, so it's distance over uh, speed, which is uh, three miles over eight miles an hour, right? So miles cancel, you end up with hours, which is equal to um, three eighths of a uh, mile per hour. And uh, so, um, no, sorry, three eighths of an hour, sorry. Hour on the bottom, oh, and the bottom is an hour on the top. <clears throat> because you multiply top and bottom by an hour to cancel out on the bottom and then it's left on top. So that's an hour on top. It's three eighths of an hour, she's got to do the whole race in. That's 0.375. And so we can actually get this one here from solving this uh, T1 plus T2 plus T3 is equal to uh, T total. And we just define that's 0.375 hours. Uh, this is 0 0.09, 0 0.16, 0 0.3, 0 0.16, sorry. Plus T3 is equal to 0.375. So T3 is equal to 0.375 minus 0 0.16 is 0 0.1, no, 0.215 minus that uh, is, um, Actually, when we add these two together, 16 and 9 is 25. Strike 25 from that is 0.125. So we can then substitute this there, 0.125. And look, we have this, we have this, we can get that. <clears throat> so now we take this row and we apply this rule. And we do that right down here. 
we have uh, speed is equal to distance over 0.125 uh, hour. Uh, it's all in hours. <clears throat> and uh, that just happens to equal 8. And so that is our answer here. So that's how you fill the chart in. And you use the rules of the chart, which is those add to that, this add to that, these, forget adding these, that doesn't work. Even averaging these doesn't work. It's, you really get to go this vertical, this vertical, and then every single one horizontal, just the ones you need. Right, we needed this, all we need is that hole to fill it in backwards. We get that hole from adding those, setting it equal to this, which we got by going horizontal there. So in the end, we use this twice and one of those once. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> be prepared to do that. What can I say? How much is that? How long has that been out of sight? Nobody told me that was out of sight. <clears throat> OK, I probably should move this camera down here a bit so that that doesn't go out of sight again. Then it'll get distorted. So. Maybe I'll just try to work up there and get a little closer so I don't get out of range again. Okay, and the other things you can do for stuff like this is um, uh, average velocity. Velocity, and remember velocity is vector. And average velocity is equal to delta uh, x over delta t, which is equal to x final minus x initial over t final minus t initial. So no in-betweens. Uh, unlike speed. And so only thing we care about is the uh, final and the initial. And that means use this. And that says that we go here to go there, it's positive y direction. It's this way is plus y. So you can immediately throw out the x ones. You can immediately throw out the zero because it went somewhere. And now you just get a matter of um, uh, sorry, it's uh, this one, right? So it could be that one. And it's now in the y direction, so the zero and x. And so in the y, you have um, the average is equal to delta y over delta t is 110 meters over, what do we say? 49 seconds. And if that was 50 seconds, it'd be about two. It's just a little bit over two because of that. Just a little bit over because of this, a little bit over because it's that. And so uh, it's pretty clearly going to be that one without even a calculator. And again, <clears throat> you've got to keep telling me if that gets off the screen. I know it's a little hard because you're not here, but still helps. Okay, now that was a couple examples of this chart. Uh, average acceleration. <clears throat> uh, so let's tell me, while we're here with the chart, these add, so this is um, uh, D1 plus D2 plus D3, and these also add uh, T1 plus T2 plus T3. But you also get across this way, uh, S1 is equal to D1 over T1, S2 is equal to D2 over T2, S3 is equal to D3 over T3, and S total is equal to D total over T total. <clears throat> okay, don't forget all the acrosses, two downs, and there's nothing in this direction. Uh, 
and that direction vertically there. That's a common, it's a nice shortcut you'd like to be able to take often, but you know, it just doesn't work. <clears throat> so uh, direction of acceleration is the net force. This comes from F net is equal to MA, right? One object, the one with the mass M is the one you're talking about. And let's see if um, the objects in some the same direction speeds up in the opposite direction, it slows down. If an object's acceleration and velocity are perpendicular, then what happens? Think for a minute. The object turns. at constant speed. I'm going to get this sooner or later. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so it turns at constant speed. Now what if it's a combination, if it's not quite perpendicular and it's not quite uh, the same? Well then you have if it's almost the same but part the same and part perpendicular, well it'll speed up and turn. <clears throat> uh, these are the pure cases, you can combine them uh, by addition as usual. Okay, so motion diagrams, the most important thing to keep in mind in a motion diagram is what is plotted against what. And what is asked for. These are the two questions when you see a bunch of curves. So if I see a bunch of curves like this, uh, all against time, and then not all, and this is actually is gonna apply to waves as well, because if you have time, you get a period, remember in oscillations, if you get a something other distance than something else. <clears throat> and suppose we have these four things, and suppose there's curves on them that look like this. This one looks like this. This one looks like this. This one looks like this. And this one looks like this. And the question is, what's the consistent set of things going on here from what we know? Well, if this is the acceleration, it's always negative. Then the slope always has to be negative on the velocity. So this would be the velocity. And this point where it crosses zero here, this is still kind of boring. That would be the point at the top where this is the um, position. Uh, x. And this one isn't anything related to it. So if you have a position that's always bending down, you have always a negative acceleration. If it's constant negative, then you have a linear velocity and a parabola for the um, <clears throat> uh, position versus time. If the acceleration is positive, it curves upwards. If it changes, it changes its slope. So these three here, uh, combinations, the slope of this is that one. The slope of this is that one. It's positive here, it goes to zero, goes negative. Uh, positive goes to zero, goes negative. Uh, <clears throat> so those are the kind of things you'd be able to go back and forth between. If you integrate under this, getting more and more negative. Okay, you start up here and you get more and more negative. Integrate under this, you start getting uh, less and less positive. So you flatten out. And then you start getting more and more negative, so you start going down. <clears throat> and uh, those are the two directions, sort of area going uh, from here to there to here, and slope going from here to there to there, curvature going, skipping one, going straight over. Okay, so the that's motion diagrams. <clears throat> uh, kinematics and free fall. Uh, you draw out your stuff, you write down 
all your variables. Here's a list of variables. Uh, down here is where you list the five variables, include any known values and what you want to look for. And what's left is an X one, get the equation from what's left from this chart and apply it. And this is true whether you're doing uh, a linear or a rotation. It's just your variables have slightly different names. It's also true of projectile motion. You have to do X separate from Y, they share the same T. Now, uh, free fall, you get G near the Earth's surface. G is 9.8 and the acceleration is minus G. Uh, in the y direction. Um, <clears throat> and the, um, uh, when the acceleration is constant, this is valid. Sometimes you can get the right answer without that, but sometimes you don't. So there are uh, other examples we can look at that have um, uh, uh, some of these things in them, but we've got a few here. <laughs> Three identical balls are released from the same height, same instance. A is from rest, B and C have velocities in the direction shown. Air is insistence neglected, so that means it's free fall. And then, uh, which reaches the ground first? Well, this one's gonna go up and then back down. That takes time. So uh, the only thing you really have to look at is remember, only look at the Y parts. And so this has V naught Y equals zero. This has V naught Y equals zero. This is V naught Y is greater than zero. So this one and this one are the same. So these two are the same. Now, which happens first? Well, you throw something up, then it's going to take longer to go down if you just drop it, because it has to go up, come down, reach the same place, and all the way down to zero again. And so uh, the... Uh, uh, B and C reach the ground first, same instant. No, not B and C. Uh, A and C. A and C, same instant. Uh, because this one just goes up, then down. And that just takes longer. If you didn't know this for sure, you could just plug in some values, put a positive VY in something, zero in the others, and calculate the time. Write your list, do the same as uh, any, um, any of these problems here. Right? There's our step-by-step -step for this type of problem. And, and if you put in just you know, one here going up, zero here, calculate the time, you'll immediately see which one is faster. Uh, you can use minus G for the acceleration. You can start them all or whatever height you want to, down one meter if you want. <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, other things, um, uh, here's one, person throws a rock up in the air, so it travels up, what is its acceleration? Air resistance is neglected, right? That means what, free fall. And free fall, we know A, Y is equal to minus G, is equal to minus 9.8 meters per second squared. And that really tells us the whole story, because what is its acceleration? There it is. Minus means downwards. We're done. That was pretty easy. 
another one you can look at is this one over here. Jenny goes outside in Hurricane Irma, uh, which, see, we're nice to you. We say it's not advisable to go out in a hurricane, but she did. And she's going to test how strong the wind is, and she throws a plastic ball into the wind. Now, if you look at this one, you say, hmm, I can probably use uh, constant acceleration if I assume it's average. It's average acceleration, so you can assume constant and, and use the uh, kinematic equations. It'll work. Uh, but it's a little faster to just use the uh, to use the um, um, uh, definition. What well, is simply a average uh, is equal to uh, delta over delta t and then you watch the signs the SIGN signs because uh, it's positive x direction to start and negative x direction to finish so this is equal to minus 8.9 meters per second uh, minus plus 8.9 meters per second. And here's one of these cases in delta t is the 0.5 seconds. So here's the case where you have a, a minus minus a plus. So you end up with a, a bigger number. It's 17.8 uh, with a minus sign on it meters per second divided by minus five, wait a minute, it's 0 0.5. That's a dot seconds. And so that's gonna give you what, 37.6 meters per second squared. Uh, unless I did my uh, 30, sorry, 30, um, 34, 35.6 meters per second, that times two is 35.6 meters per second squared. <laughs> now, if you had done it wrong and not realized it's a minus by a minus because you didn't watch your signs, you'd have gotten this one and that would have been wrong. So watch the signs whenever you're doing a delta V and a change in direction happens. It's gonna come up in momentum, it's gonna come up here. By the way, while we're on this page, let's look at this one. This one here is vector addition. Uh, draw a triangle, right triangle to go to components, add them, and then uh, you draw another triangle, right triangle to go back to polar essentially which is the angle and the magnitude so <clears throat> there's no shortcut you have to do these steps so there you do okay that's some um, some examples for this part <clears throat> now uh uh, I guess that was our first vector example right here. The big thing is to going to uh, two components and uh, between Cartesian, which is components, and polar, which is magnitude and angle. And uh, to do vector math, add and subtract, you need uh, components. And so to convert between those, you've got to draw a triangle, a right triangle, 
where you have uh, an X part, a Y part, and uh, well, typically you draw it from here, so there's your theta. <clears throat> that would be the Y axis, that would be the X axis. You draw out the magnitude and direction, and then of course you could use the top, this is more convenient. You can then use your Sokotoa. And you can use it in both directions, either this way or that way. Um, Pythagorean theorem comes in useful as well. Okay, the 2D kinematics basically is the same as 1D kinematics. You've got delta x, v naught x, uh, a x, well v x in the final position, a x, delta y, v naught in the y direction, v y, a y, and time is shared. So these are the variables. We did a bunch of demonstrations up at the beginning of the class. X is independent of Y, but happen at the same time. So that is shared. And that's how you get from one side to another. So if it goes up and down a certain amount, you get the time, you plug it in over here to see what V, uh, what X was doing. And when you have projectiles, uh, you have A, Y is equal to minus G is equal to minus 9.8 meters per second squared, and A, X is equal to zero. <clears throat> and they follow a parabolic path in uh, x, y. Uh, <clears throat> and so notice that's not 5t, it's x and y. Relative velocity, <clears throat> really this is your key equation. So you pull out uh, number and problem. Uh, to, you know, V, you know, something, something else. And use this equation. And you sometimes need, uh, turn it around. So sometimes you need uh, VBA is equal to minus VAB. This is a vector equation. So really two equations. X and Y or sometimes you can draw a triangle. Key there is sometimes. That's if, uh, particularly if one is in X and the other is in Y, then uh, of these things, then you can solve the other one from a triangle. That happens in, somehow that happens in 211, much more often happens in real life. And uh, remember that uh, this is the object and this is uh, what it is measured. It is with respect to And so you get that um, common scenario there of uh, uh, what it's respect to. And let me see if I happen to have a. Uh, uh, we do have an example here we can do. Michael is flying his plane, approaching and moving aircraft carrier. 
In one instant, the plane is moving this far relative to the water, and this aircraft is this much relative to the water. What is the aircraft coverage velocity relative to Michael's plane at this instant? So here we have three things. The plane, the water, and the aircraft carrier. And so we want uh, velocity of the aircraft carrier relative to the plane. And we know that that's going to be V aircraft carrier relative to the water plus V water relative to the plane. And what do we get here? <clears throat> Due south relative to the water. So this is uh, V plane relative to the water, which is um, equal to minus V water relative to the plane. That's that. <clears throat> and this here, 30 relative to the water, so this is V aircraft carrier relative to the water. It is directly equal to this. So we make coordinates, and normally we'll make, uh, okay, east and north. By the way, so this thing here is now 163 miles per hour uh, north because it's opposite south. Right, and it's opposite because we flipped it. And so that goes there, we make northeast uh, put this into components, add, and then we want the, uh, uh, I think this is circle because it's supposed to be speed. <clears throat> uh, I think it was in the test. This is when I was catching the typo because there's no direction there unless we just speed. So you add and then use Pythagorean to get the speed. <clears throat> okay, so that's how you do it. You write this down what you want in terms of the others. Remember the inner one kind of goes away when you add them. And so that tells you what you need to find in the problem. Like one of them we found, the other one was opposite. We took the minus, the next to north. Um, and you can go through then and solve that in a reasonably straightforward fashion. The key is being able to pick out what's here. Usually we try to make it pretty clear with the relative to, and then getting this in the right order and you're okay. And then of course there isn't a matter of getting you know, 32 degrees, 45 south of west, right? So south of west, you start west, and then you rotate towards the south. All right, so here's our plot. This is east, that's north. You rotate towards the south, and you end up, this is 30 degrees, the 45 degrees south of west. Right, 45, we'll put it up here, 45 degrees south of west. <clears throat> and that is our, um, that's our direction for um, the aircraft carrier relative to the water, this one here. So now you calculate out your north is going to be negative, your east is going to be negative, and you put that together, see what you end up with. <clears throat> Of course, there's no east on this. It doesn't really matter what the sign that is. You'll square it and you do Pythagorean theorem anyway. Okay, so that's relative velocity. And um, 
Now we go on to Newton's laws. <clears throat> that was chapter four. And the sort of key things is at an instant. It's a common thing you see. There's no initial and final. Uh, involves forces, accelerations, statics, acceleration is equal to zero, common case for Newton's laws. <clears throat> and of course, um, rotational motion, again, you know something about the acceleration. So normally, uh, uh, these are the cases here. The net comes important <clears throat> and so there's a bunch of equations we can sort of put together about that. When we get to um, Newton's second law, we need the F net. <clears throat> and so uh, we're adding vectors. So we have to do that by components. And so the easiest way is to do force X and Y, make a chart. The components then are in here for X, in here for Y. When you sum them up, you get F net in the X and F net in the Y which of course is MAX and MAY. And that components, it helps you not to forget any forces if you're, if, you're, um, if you're doing it this way. Uh, and so then you look around for what the accelerations might be. Statics, they're both zero. Uh, if you're involving a circular motion, you get a V squared over R. If you are going along a surface, then perpendicular to it, zero acceleration. Um, and sometimes it's just, you have to put in a letter. Hope you can solve for it. Uh, that'll show up when you have two objects, right? And these have to do, do once for each object. You also, of course, need to do your free body. And then you put the forces on here, starting at the dot, so you can project easily. And you write the acceleration off to the side, right? The acceleration off to the side is the um, useful when you have centripetal because you know which way it's going. Sometimes they tell you. Let me go through our list of possible forces. There's weight. Um, <clears throat> there's, um, oh, and of course, when you're choosing these things here, you also need to choose axes. And so you might, if you have a problem like this, choose X and Y. Problem, problem like that, you'll often choose X and Y. Um, <clears throat> so keep those in mind. Oops. And uh, Newton's third law, you know this is happening when the forces are on different objects. and they're equal and opposite. This one actually comes up occasionally. It'll come up in collision sometimes. It'll come up in recoil or in um, two people are standing together and they push apart. Uh, 
they push apart, they have the same net force at the same time, so the same impulse, but they're negative. That's Newton's third law. Uh, or we can concoct something else. This is what we call a definition type because, oh, they're on different things. Oh, we can, we can just immediately say, boom, we're done with that. <laughs> uh, normal force. Basically, there are two surface forces. Perpendicular to the surface is the normal force. Parallel to the surface is friction. So normal force has to be perpendicular. It usually means it doesn't do any work if something's sliding along the force because it's perpendicular to the motion. Friction being parallel to the surface will often do work if you have friction. Uh, tension, either static or dynamics, you need the rules of the ropes. And they are, um, well, <clears throat> if there's the rules of the ropes, you have two objects. Right, one on each end of the rope. <laughs> and so you're going to have, therefore, two free body diagrams or force diagrams. Uh, two charts F, X, Y. Uh, two F net X equals M A X F net Y equals M A Y. Uh, and you use the rules of the rope to uh, uh, match uh, magnitude of tension, magnitude of A, which we call A. <clears throat> And so just for a couple of examples here, if I have two objects like this, so this is one and this is two, uh, A1x is equal to A2x is equal to A. If I have something like this, the pulley, and one, two, I have here, if I take X and Y for both of them, I have uh, this one, if it goes this way, this one goes that way, right? This one goes this way, it's the same. Uh, so this one I have A is equal to A one X is equal to minus A two Y, because Y is down, not up. So you just plug those into your F net equals M A Y's. And if I have uh, another one like this, one, two, and let's assume one goes up, then two goes down. I have uh, A one Y is equal to minus A two Y is equal to A. Again, I put it in that way and get my answer. And these things work whether it's static or dynamic. In fact, if it's static, you just set all the a's equal to zero. It's easy. As dynamic, okay, now you really have to do this. And you're gonna have to take the two equations, put in this, put in the tension, solve two equations and two unknowns. That's what you're gonna end up doing if you have two objects and it's dynamic. You have two objects and it's static, well, A is zero everywhere, so that's easier. So whenever it's static, <clears throat> uh, A equals zero. So use it. 
this problem here, any of these problems become trivial if A is zero because you get a zero. Tension can be gotten in one equation. You don't have to write A and solve the messy thing. Just put zeros there. Tension falls out very quickly. So if it's static, it makes it easier. How do you know it's static? It's not moving. You can read that out of the problem. <laughs> okay, in dynamic ones, you're going to have to do more work. Okay, so now we've lost that. Let's see if we can get it back. Sometimes this works. If it doesn't work, I have to do this, um, which will get us there eventually. <clears throat> okay, so now we're to uh, friction and drag. So static friction, we have the less than equal to, so we don't know. Fs, so put Fs into the chart and solve. A equals zero if static. Okay, over here, <clears throat> we can just put this into chart. Um, and then you need to get in and plug it in here. So you're going to get often two equations and two unknowns. This one here is, that's the uh, definition. So if there's a drag force, you're just going to apply the definition to get the drag force. And there's not too much else to do about it. <clears throat> Angular variables is our next one. Uh, the um, <clears throat> key things here is to know the translation and names. So displacement goes to angular displacement. They're related by R. If theta is in radians, right? So radians is key here, not degrees. Doesn't work if it's in degrees. Uh, average velocity goes to average omega or angular velocity <clears throat> related by R if omega is radians per second. That's key, doesn't work otherwise. If it's degrees per second, don't expect this to work. You had to convert the degrees from 2 pi into radians. So actually it's 2 pi over 360, or pi over 180. Acceleration, again, it goes the same kind of formula. And again, because of that, you get the same R everywhere because they're really the same formulas. That's what makes the kinematic equations the same for both of them. So, uh, 2 pi radians is equal to 360 degrees is equal to one cycle <clears throat> or one rotation or one revolution. You'll see all of those in, in uh, our problems. So that's um, and then of course there's a rolling without slipping then you have the V tangential is equal to R times omega. And V tangential is equal to V of the object that is rolling. <clears throat> okay, so if it's rolling without slipping, you basically have this equation applying. Centripetal acceleration is simply this. And how does this work? Um, by the way, this equation here follows immediately from the V tangential as R omega. You can actually see that, plug it in, there it is. R squared omega squared over R, R omega squared. Uh, so you really don't need to remember both, but um, AC is perpendicular to V, so speed not changed. 
not by this, by, uh, by AC. You need uh, a tangential to change speed. And a tangential, of course, from our chart up above is equal to R alpha. <clears throat> so if you have alpha, you have a tangential, you change the speed. If alpha is zero, you don't have an a tangential, constant speed, go around, still have some triple acceleration if you're going around in a circle. This here is from there. And this is sort of uh, second law is just like it was before. But you get a uh, from this. And so that's the common thing we will do. Uh, Newton's laws of gravity. The big thing to remember for this is the mass is the same uh, on any, anywhere really. Uh, but the weight can change. It changes with little g and little g is right there. <clears throat> mass of the planet times big G over the radius of the planet squared. That is little g. So it varies with mass of the planet, the radius of the planet. Big G is a constant. And then you get mg, right? That's our little mg. So this is a generalization of our weight is mg. Uh, and this is key to solving problems that use this. Because we'll often ask you, What's the weight on one planet when you know the weight on another planet? Let's see if I have any of those um, handy here. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, oh, yes. I knew I had one of those. Sorry, I had to wait a little bit, but here we go. On Mars, the acceleration of gravity, little g, is 3.7 meters per second. The rock weighs 191 newtons on Mars. So weight on Mars is equal to mg on Mars. And so m is equal to the weight on Mars over g on Mars is um, 191 newtons divided by 3.7 meters per second squared, and that's going to be in kilograms. And now the weight on Earth is equal to m times our g on Earth. And g on Earth is our good old 9.8 meters per second squared. <clears throat> and so that's how you solve this kind of problem. <clears throat> Okay, um, other problems here. Um, this one here, you've got an initial and a final. Uh, throwing a ball for his dog. That sounds like projectile motion. And projectile motion is kinematic equation. in 2D, uh, so you have delta x, v naught x, v x, a x equals zero, you have time, delta y, v naught y, v y, a y is equal to minus g, so minus 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, you plug in what you've got a couple of times if you have to, solve the other one. Uh, how far, and this is the same thing, uh, more of you just you can solve it from ground zero starting with what you had and what's in there to get it or usually since we did the one on the top if you want to believe your answer there then you can use that and use whatever equation you want to if you don't want to believe your answer for the one previous one then you start the same way as you did here you just have different numbers to go in there and you can check your answers at the end to see if they're compatible with each other 
other things on this page, uh, force points one way, force in the other, most this is vector addition. And so add components. And then a triangle, a right triangle to uh, get magnitude and angle. Magnitude is C, I guess we should put in there. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, we've done, uh, done most of these things in here now. Uh, this one here we didn't do. An elevator in Riddick travels first floor to second floor. That's the physics building, even though we didn't have our class there. Um, <clears throat> pauses momentarily and travels to the third floor. Pauses again back to the floor. Vertical position is plotted below. Okay, what's the instantaneous speed? That's the slope uh, right there. Is the same along a straight line. And at 35 seconds, 35 is right here. And so this straight line right here, use uh, final minus initial on the straight line. And so I would use, that's your initial and that is your final. And of course, V is equal to uh, X final minus X, or in this case, Y final minus Y initial over T final minus T initial. And you can read off the two times, you can read off the two Y's, you plug it in, you get the answer. Why did I choose these two points? Because they're right, uh, that one's on this line, you can read off the values, it's on this line, you can read off the values. So I tried to do it here. Well, first I need two points, and this is in the middle, it's hard to tell where I am, but if you use those two points, you know exactly where you are. That's why the straight line, uh, you can extend out from there and go to both points. Okay. Uh, here, we wanted to know the normal force, magnitude of the normal force. And the first thing is to say is push somewhat down, partly. Uh, so normal force is not equal to uh, mg. <clears throat> not equal to is solved from the plot. So you have to write force x, y, and then you've got, um, uh, we can sort of fill this out, <clears throat> uh, f uh, floor is got uh, zero and x, normal and y, I'm doing x, Y force of friction is 50 newtons in the plus X, zero there. F gravity is uh, mg and the negative Y. And F push is equal to well, the cosine 25 is in the x, and so it's negative in the x. So it's minus uh, F push cosine 25 degrees, and it is negative also in the y direction, so minus F push sine 25 degrees. Sum these up, uh, zero, is equal to, well, ma y is equal to zero because it's no bounce. Uh, 
is equal to uh, f net y is equal to n minus mg minus f push sine 25 degrees. And you go look up here and you say push is a 119, 15 kilogram box. Get 15 kilograms, g is our friend g. That's zero, got f push, got the sine of 25. N's the only thing you don't know, you can solve for it. <clears throat> and so that is how you do this one. Uh, this one here is uh, they place the hands and push together each other. And so this one here is, I haven't quite covered this section yet. So let's take a break and see what else we uh, not covered in here. This is one that we have covered. This is an elevator problem. Uh, that would be a Newton's second law. Uh, but watch the A. And the other thing to remember these is that the scale, if there is one, measures the normal force. <clears throat> okay, and so uh, the normal force is smaller in magnitude than the gravitational force is shown. So give it the following possible description. Well, if you add those, you have F net had to go better go down. And so uh, A had better go down. And if that means, uh, so what does A down mean? It means if it's going down, moves, down, speeds up, moves up, slows down, and okay, so forget the constant speeds, we have an acceleration. Okay, moves down, speeds up, moves down, slowing, nope. Uh, moves up, slows down, moving up, these two, uh, slowing. There we have it. That's got to be it. <clears throat> so if you write this down, this logic, write these two down, now start looking for it. You'll uh, get your answer. So what else do we have here? We've got that one to do. Um, so let's continue on here. <clears throat> um, We've got uh, energy and work. <clears throat> energy is a scalar. That's good news. It's good news because uh, the uh, um, no components. That's good news. So if you can solve it this way, it usually helps. Uh, the total energy is, can't be created, therefore is conserved, but mechanical energy, uh, Ke plus Pe, uh, can be lost, can be changed by work non-conserving. <clears throat> Uh, so the uh, other things to remember here, okay, so work non-conserving is delta E mechanical, and that's delta Ke plus delta Pe, because Ke plus Pe is mechanical. <laughs> and this is your go-to equation. That's where you start anything that's energy, 
has initial, has final, because you need that to do the deltas. Uh, this is your, usually your starting place. As long as you have some potential energies changing or some speed changing, then this is usually where you're going to end up. You need to know how to calculate uh, work. <clears throat> uh, if you have all forces in X or all motion in X, you can use this. You can also convert X to Y or Z, whatever direction it happens to be. Otherwise, it's better to just say, okay, it's FD cos and theta, and the projection is the is the cos and theta that tells you which way it's going. You still need to have a straight line motion for D and a constant force and straight line motion. <clears throat> uh, then this works. So, so the spring where you don't have a constant force, that doesn't work so well. Uh, <clears throat> but we do have a formula of potential energy for a spring that means you don't have to calculate its work because its work is minus change of potential energy. And that gets us out of it for that particular case. The other thing to remember here is power is equal to work over time. And this is the useful power is work over time is um, delta energy. over time. <clears throat> and so uh, uh, that comes up a little bit later on. When you're talking about the work energy theorem, it's the total work done, with the change in kinetic energy. How do these two connected? They're connected through potential energy delta is equal to minus the work done by whatever force it is, uh, by that force. And so like for gravity, potential energy of gravity is minus the work done by gravity, potential energy of spring is minus the work done by spring. And so this, when we put in that piece of the total work, uh, you get the minus delta PEs that when you move it to the other side give you this equation here. And what you didn't calculate the work for, because you didn't have potential energy, that's everything over here. So work non-conserving are things like, you know, people, friction, etc. Things that you don't know how to get a potential energy for and you didn't calculate the work for them. Uh, okay. So um, that's kind of said down here. And uh, friction drag person over here, I think is or some other object that you're not calculating the work for. <clears throat> um, but whatever you're doing here, you're doing work non-conserving is equal to delta ke plus delta pe <clears throat> that's the key thing and this is of course ke final minus ke initial plus pe final minus pe initial and ke here is equal to uh, Ke translational plus Ke rotational is a half m v squared plus one half i omega squared. And if it's rolling, you can relate the i to the other. And then potential energy is equal to the sum of all you have, which could be um, mgy plus one half kx squared. Um, if you happen to have 
tensional energy, gravity, and tensional energy of a spring. <clears throat> of course, you can have all these things. You can have something roll into a spring if you wanted to, going downhill, and you can mix everything. That <clears throat> probably unlikely to happen, but theoretically it could. And so, continuing on with 7D, you get this. <clears throat> And sometimes you're calculating this, sometimes it's zero. Uh, so this is one way to get work. It's often zero. You have to read the problem. And the um, other things to keep in mind as you're looking through this, mostly we've kind of done this before, potential energy of a spring comes up there. Uh, the useful part back here, that's from the equation. This is what needs to be supplied. And so when you're calculating this efficiency, you get, um, the part from the equation and the part needs to be supplied. So when you're calculating these things, you often uh, will use this equation right here, where you calculate what you need and then you want the total, or it says this much it took, and then you have to get P useful from that. <clears throat> that's what you put into the equation. Don't try to put P total into the equation. It isn't going to work that way. <clears throat> okay. Um, so um, this equation here is used uh, more often than that one. And it's used uh, <clears throat> and there are plenty of homeworks that had that on there. You can go back and look at. Uh, let's talk about linear momentum and impulse. These come from collisions. And I've lost my focus yet again, so let me catch it up at the top and bring it down. And there we have it. <clears throat> I'll leave the thing there to keep it. Linear momentum is what you care about when you have two objects. Impulse you care about when you have just one object. Uh, this here is really Newton's second law for one object. You can't write Newton's second law for two objects, you have to write it twice. But uh, F is equal to uh, uh, MA, really comes the impulse is delta P, delta P over delta T, uh, P is M times V, so delta P is m delta v over delta t is m a. <laughs> That's where that comes from. And so this whole thing here is this sort of one object type stuff. And uh, the conservation of momentum and recoil, that's your two object type stuff. So there are two objects. And you have the initial and x, final and x, initial and y, and final and y. These equations here are just momentum conservation. And it's true when you have no external forces.
if you have an external forces, it can change the momentum of your system. We will uh, have many cases where that uh, does not happen. And we'll say it's on a frictionless surface. There's some other reason to keep it that way. Uh, if you have elastic, Ke is concern, inelastic, it's not. Both have momentum. If no external forces. And so here's your step by step how to do that. We call it recoil if the initial velocities are the same. We call it perfectly inelastic if the final velocities are the same. The equations you have for recoil, inelastic, and perfectly inelastic are exactly the same. Only in this case, you can set V1 final and V2 final to be the same. In this case, for a recoil up here, you can set uh, the two V initials to be the same, but it's the same equation. Elastic, we won't be doing the 2D because you get quadratic equations, it's messy and you don't really learn anything else, but we do do uh, 2D for inelastic. But the elastic is usually 1D, we have these two equations, they're both linear, so you don't run into quadratic equation, you can solve it. And we'll run into several of these and a bunch of the other ones. The other ones are all the same, as long as you take that into account when you're plugging in, fine, just treat them all the same. So you're either doing just this or you're doing that in combination with this. <clears throat> uh, those are your collision formulas. And now, we can do Tom and his little sister. <clears throat> and you might say, why did I wait here? They place their hands together and push against each other. <clears throat> On an ice rink, right? So that means no external forces. Push against each other. Tom's mass, his sister's that. Acceleration of a sister is this. What's Tom's acceleration? <clears throat> okay, so could this be momentum conservation? Well, it asks about acceleration. So probably not. Although that would be something you'd think about here. So what does have acceleration? What does have acceleration is Newton's third law. And that one sort of raises its head this way. Sometimes you think, well, the reason why I put it off is because you look at this and say, oh, they're pushing against each other. I bet this is a recoil problem. Well, it would be a recoil problem if we're asking about velocities. This is asking about accelerations. And that says that the force magnitude of A on B is equal to the magnitude of the force of B on A. And so if we work on absolute values, MA, um, acceleration of A in magnitude is equal to the MB, the acceleration on B in magnitude. And so if we want the magnitude of the accelerations, uh, A, B over AA is equal to, uh, that's in the top, so it's MA over MB. And so if I say, uh, let's see, we give his sister's acceleration, so let's call her A. Sister will be A and Tom will be B. If I bring this down, you can actually see it. <clears throat> and so that means that um, A, uh, B is equal to MA over MB of A, which is the sister's mass of 30 kilograms over Tom's mass of 60 kilograms, sister's acceleration 1.8 meters per second squared. And because he's twice the mass, you get half the acceleration. So that's uh, 0.9 meters per second squared. Let's be that one, of course. 
So this one here looks, when you say, oh, no external force, it's starting to look a lot like momentum conservation, but acceleration here. That changes the picture some and brings us down to Newton's second law where we get this. Now, if it had been a um, momentum one, it would have fit into the initial velocities the same, both zero, pushing each other off. And you'd have done this with the same velocities here of zero. So eventually you'd end up with that. And fine, OK, one's negative the other. And by the ratio of the masses again. So the math would have been very similar, but we've been talking about v's, not a's. It's a's, it's Newton, v's, it's momentum. When you see problems like that. <clears throat> OK, so that's. Um, that's our, our stuff here. So um, this, remember, is these are all the same. Uh, and it just depends that you have to just plug in the right values. Which includes those things are up to the top. <clears throat> Uh, this is the same too, and this comes from uh, these two plus uh, algebra in 1D gives you that. <clears throat> it needs 1D, otherwise it doesn't work out so nicely. And so now you just have the same thing you had before plus one more criteria, and you can solve this. This is relatively... Uh, easier. This is quadratic equation, usually. <clears throat> so, okay. Um, now, if you want to know how much energy is lost, that's equal to work non-conserving is delta Ke uh, plus delta PE. Often this is zero. In which case it's delta KE and you can find out the loss. If it happens quickly, that will be true. Sometimes you do get a little bit of, um, uh, sometimes you do get a little bit of potential energy change. Uh, if it happens fast, you wouldn't, but if it happens slower, then maybe you would. And so this equation, which is just energy, right? Energy loss, okay, energy method. And the energy method is work non conserving is delta key plus delta PE, right? That's how it works. Um, next thing we want to talk about is um, torque and you know, the, the torque thing here that's kind of important and uh, what I want to do here is to talk <clears throat> about um, a couple of things that come up. Now, I just did a nice review on basically all this stuff through uh, the um, the other chapters, so I don't want to spend too, too much time on this, but there is a couple of problems here that are useful to think about because I know they cause you trouble. And let's see if I happen to have one of them on me. But uh, I don't have it now, but let's, I'll draw it out. <clears throat> Okay, if you have an axis here and you have a lever arm, length R, and you apply a force, then you can extend this out and call this V, and then you plug into this equation and you get the right plus minus. Right? <clears throat> and so this gives. Correct 
plus or minus. Uh, that's counterclockwise is plus, clockwise is minus. If you use this as a fee or this as a um, 180 minus phi, then the sine of phi is equal to the sine of 180 minus phi. Actually, I shouldn't use the, I should use theta here um, because it's not that phi, it's theta, right? So this messy theta on top of phi, uh, sine of that is equal to sine of 180 minus that, so it doesn't matter which one you use, but you put the S-I-G-N in by hand. And how do you put it in by hand? Okay, which way is it going? It goes clockwise, but minus, it goes counterclockwise, but plus. In this case, it's pulling downwards. That's clockwise, right? Pulling like that, it goes clockwise, it's minus. Uh, that's how you choose which angle you use. So if you just choose the neighboring angle to this on either side, fine. Sign's gonna be the same, get the same magnitude, you gotta put the plus and minus in. If you go take the extension, go counterclockwise over to where the force is, they'll take care of the plus and minus for you. <clears throat> okay, that's the big thing on this. Uh, static equilibrium, now it's with torque. So the big thing is you replace this with a line in the free body or force diagram. And uh, you got to calculate the torques. So you choose axis and x and y and you make your chart force x y torque and this is about the new axis and you use the methods up there and how to do it <clears throat> and then for statics you have um, alpha equals zero, a is a vector zero, that's ax and ay, and you sum those, all these columns, set them equal to zero. <clears throat> and the choice of axis, by the way, is to get rid of, so no torque from unknown and unwanted forces. If you choose this properly, often you can get away with just this column. If you don't choose it properly, you get to work with everything. If you ask for more than one thing, like the bicycle, when somebody sits on it, how much weight in the front tire, the back tire, okay, then you're gonna to have to do more than one thing to get more than one number, of course. So you're gonna to have to do both. <clears throat> Center mass. Uh, uh, it will uh, rotate about the center of mass if uh, no external forces. And that happens in projectile motion, for example, but not rolling, it's external forces in rotating. And to get the center of mass, You use x center mass is equal to sum of xi m sub i over the total of the m sub i's. Same for y, and that um, gets you to your answer. <clears throat> uh, uh, rotational dynamics. Uh, our first rotational kinematics um, name changes again as I told you before names change 
but uh, same as linear in terms of how you solve it. <clears throat> Rotational dynamics, F equals MA, or net goes to torque net is equal to I alpha, right? Newton number two. Uh, you need to get the uh, moment of inertia. Uh, rotational kinetic energy, okay. Um, it's the same energy formula. But you have this, it's about the only change. Uh, put zeros in as needed. And of course you roll without slip, I did before. You have V uh, right, um, uh, tangential. Uh, equals V center mass is R omega. <clears throat> and when you get to angular momentum, that I is the moment of inertia. And this is true for any object. This one's true for a point object. So be careful which one uh, you're using. I can change. Uh, it does in some problems. And that's the key. Um, and also when you're doing these sort of things here, those are some problems, especially those problems right there. And when you have these here, you uh, watch the same omegas. Because that can be another thing that is helpful to get it done. Um, Again, I've showed you this before. Linear angular, their connections. We now add torque uh, related to the force. Uh, and again, it's R perpendicular to F, F perpendicular times R. Uh, sine theta is the one that makes the perpendicular pieces. Momentum, I omega. Uh, this is for a point object, uh, which is a little bit of a special case. That's for a point object too, by the way. <clears throat> That's more general. And then we go to our basic kinematics with all the names changed for you. Second law with all the name changes for you. Energy, okay, we don't even bother changing names. If it's linear, there's none of that. Rotation's in there, there it is too. And the uh, conservation momentum turns out to be uh, also very similar and used pretty much the same way as well. Now, um, I'm gonna spend too long on this, but um, if we go to uh, simple harmonic motion, uh, you have to watch what's over here. That's time. And so this is the period if there was a position over here, you get the wavelength. Keep those apart. Okay, max PE, max KE, that matters down here, right? Here are the max values, X, V, A. Radians, think about mode your calculator is in. If there's an angle for a vector, use degrees. If it's radians, use radians. Uh, this is when it's all Ke. 
this when it's all PE, this is when it's all KE, this when it's all PE. And you can also write this down as one half MB squared plus one half KX squared, which is when it's in between. You can do the same thing over here. So it's going to be somewhere in between. You get this. This one, of course, it would be half MB squared plus MGY, not Y max, <clears throat> for the in between case. Uh, but um, most of these things just follow from this simple rule here. This follows from that, and omega is k over m squared is k over m. Hey, look, k over m times uh, x is equal to, uh, well, take the omega out, it is x minus sign. Technically, there's a minus sign in there. And so, um, magnitude, that's what you get. So, that is our oscillations when you go to waves. Again, we've had a recent review on this, so I'm going to be a little bit quick here. This is key, and remember that the frequency is fixed. So, uh, if V changes, lambda changes. And that, of course, happens when you go different media. Because V is determined by the medium, frequency by the source. And lambda just does what it's supposed to do. <clears throat> uh, down here, by the way, these are all available under the exam parts at the top, these uh, sections. If this is x, you get lambda wavelength. Just like before, you had t, which was period. Right, uh, I pop back to that page, which was, where was that page? Oh, it's right here. See, period is when you have time. Wavelength is have position. And simple harmonic motion, uh, is uh, uh, basically it's what I just showed you. Right? In fact, this is doing the same thing here, yeah. <clears throat> except I lose this again. Uh, sound waves, <clears throat> uh, you can really, this is the key here. This is the one we're going to use. Kelvin is here. This is uh, shifts, so you have to get Kelvin from it. Make sure that you have those around if you don't remember them. That's the speed in uh, air. So you use that in your V is equal to lambda times uh, frequency. Uh, you want to be able to go uh, <clears throat> both ways on on this one here. So this one really needs to come with an i is equal to 10 to the power beta over 10 minus 12. Uh, the beta is in dB and i is in watts per square meter. Uh, so normally you have P, some one power is equal to I1 times A1. Another place, it's I2 times A2. And so be prepared to use this more than once. This thing here, oops, that one. <clears throat> so you do it for the one, and uh, you can do it at the same source, two distances. So P is the same, or it can be, uh, or I can be the same.
And so, uh, but a uh, listener uh, can be different from the a of the sphere. All right, so the, the sphere is how it spreads out, but you can take a smaller, the, take a small chunk of the big sphere and get the eyes the same, because per area, different areas get a different power. So P is different. Or P is the same, because you're just looking at two people, different distances. Okay, it's the same area. Well, different areas, same power. And uh, for the uniform, spread uh, a equals four pi r squared is the area of a sphere right so again this is db and this is watts per meter squared okay the doppler stuff here this comes in as a definition so you simply apply the formula. Top sign here and here. Is towards. Uh, lower. Sign. Leaving. Or away. LLTT if you want to remember it. S equals source. O equals observer, and you've got to keep, if you keep all these straight, then you'll get the right answer. And V is, of course, the wave speed. Uh, for force beats, you know, again, it's a plug-in. Uh, wave interference and resonance. Uh, you've got nodes, anti-nodes. Note how to identify them. They happen at resonance. Uh, if you have uh, resonant frequencies, the nth harmonic has Fn is equal to n times F naught. That's our F1, sorry, because uh, that's the fundamental frequency. And there's another way of numbering them where you have overtones. And fundamental. Fundamental is just F1. Uh, but the overtones is uh, sometimes uh, open close. You don't have all the um, harmonics and close close. You have. Um, overtone is equal to n uh, minus one. <clears throat> and you see that over here, where standing waves on a string, right? This is the v in v is equal to f lambda. And you see that for the nth harmonic right here, Fn is equal to Nf1, which we wrote above. That's the second harmonic. Subtract one to get the overtone. That's because it's um, tied tied on the two ends of a string. If you had a string free to move on the ends, it would be different. If moved free to move on both ends, it would be the same. Free to move on one end, we don't do, but it would be uh, similar to uh, some of these other problems. So this one here, by the way, is n's fix. It means to get inversion at the ends, so there's nodes there. And reflection, so nodes at ends. 
And if you get, um, Standing waves and air columns, open both ends or closed both ends, give you the same result. Uh, v here is equal to 331 meters per second, square root of T over 273 Kelvin for sound in air. And the fundamental looks like this or like this. N equals one. Remember how you count it? It's one anti-node, one node, or two half nodes, two half anti-nodes, half and half is one. Uh, over here, you get this. That's, so this is, notice, so this is one wavelength. And then when I draw this one in, or that one in, you can see how they fit together. And you see there's two anti nodes, n is equal to two. This also can come this way. Uh, <clears throat> if it's open, open. So this is close, close, inverted, open, open. And over here you get, um, okay, you get one and a half waves. Or you do it the other way, and a half. So this is open, this is closed. N equals three, Fn is equal to Nf1. If you go to open on one end or closed on the other. It's the same V sound as we had up there. The fundamental looks like this, open to close, open, closed. Uh, we go to one higher, it goes uh, like this. It has to be closed over here and open over there. We go to one higher, we go um, just like this. Can't draw it quite right, but uh, uh, you get these. Uh, this is slightly different. <clears throat> There's uh, no two for N, just the odd harmonics. But this is still the first overtone, second overtone, the fundamental. So you get um, harmonics are one, three, five. But um, the overtones fundamental is still get fundamental and uh, first overtone, second overtone. So the overtones don't really care what the harmonic is. There's always fundamental first, second. But over here, it made sense because it's shifted by one. Down here, you still, by the way, have Fn is equal to Nf1. Harmonic number still comes in. Uh, but the overtones now are completely different. So you have to be careful with the overtones when you have an open, closed uh, tube. And so that's something I will be looking forward to you to get right. Uh, <clears throat> the fluid statics is our very last piece that we've covered this semester. And I will uh, probably take a break in, uh, after going through this, and then we'll do a few uh, problems from test three and practice problems. Uh, <clears throat> fluid statics, uh, pressure is force per area. This we use in hydraulics. 
which is pistons. Again, we'll use it um, a couple of times. Pressure is perpendicular to a surface. Hydraulic lift right here. That's from what we use for hydraulics, right? Force over area is force over area because P is the same with uh, Pascal's delta P is the same. Uh, fluid statics, P absolute is equal to P gauge uh, plus P atmosphere. You correct, you subtract that out in the gauge. So you have to add it back in if you want to get to absolute. And the uh, this is the fluid that it sits in. So the buoyant force. doesn't care about the, um, the density of the object, uh, just its volume. And you will use a um, free body diagram with uh, force buoyant uh, as one of the forces. Uh, if you actually want to solve something with this. And then, of course, you also have your uh, pressure versus depth. Now, you're probably getting quite tired of listening to me. It's expected we've been going on quite a while here. So what I will uh, do now is do some examples later, and we'll stop this right now uh, for the time being. So uh, let me see you later.